floor for a more general discussion uh, with questions from the audience. Um, so we'll start, of course, with, uh, with Moore Nauman, and, and I'll be happy to um, uh, give his introduction now. Uh, so Moore is an associate professor of information science at the Jacobs Technique and Cornell Institute at Cornell Tech, where he's the founder of the Connective Media Hub. Moore's research applies multidisciplinary methods to, number one, gain a better understanding of people and their use of social technology. Number two, extract insights about people, technology, and society from social media and other sources of social data. And number three, develop new social technologies as well as novel tools to make social data more accessible and usable in various settings. Previously, Moore was at the faculty of Rutgers, SC and I, led a, a research team at Yahoo Research Berkeley, received a PhD in computer science from Stanford University, and played professional basketball. <laughs> Didn't see that one coming. <laughs> Where? <laughs> um, uh, Opel Tel Aviv, did I say that correctly? Uh, close enough. <laughs> awesome. Um, he's a recipient of an NSF Early Career Award, um, research awards and grants from numerous corporations, including Oath, Facebook, and Google, and multiple Best Paper Awards. Uh, so let's give Moore a warm welcome. Thank you, I'm, and I'm honored to be the first uh, to speak here, and thank you for the invitation and hospitality, and, the, uh, and I, this is the first first workshop I've ever been to that uh, still kept on time even after one hour of, uh, <laughs> of seven or eight, I, I think I heard from, we heard from. Uh, and it's, it is wonderful to be here with all, uh, with so many friends and uh, great speakers, and looking forward to the other talks today as well. Uh, so the truth, systems of truth, I uh, changed it to be systems of trust, uh, uh, truth require trust. Uh, we studied and thought about trust in the last few years in my lab, mostly in the context of uh, the sharing economy. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about that today, but we'll also connect that to the hot topics of uh, the day. Uh, this is really me thinking through, uh, so I'm a computer scientist uh, by education, as you pointed out, but thinking through some of the theoretical framing uh, of, uh, uh, that can help us think about this problem and design those systems. Uh, and it turns out that nature has been obsessed with trust in terms of honest signals for billions of years. So this is about signaling theory, uh, mostly the talk, and some ideas, and, and maybe, uh, maybe not, they can help us figure out uh, this challenge. This is uh, work done at Cornell Tech uh, with uh, my student, mostly work by my excellent PhD student, uh, Xiao, uh, and other collaborators uh, as well. Speaking of Cornell Tech, I'm gonna use 30 seconds of my time to just show you, this is the newest tech on the block. Uh, so here's a picture, this is uh, the campus. I'm not used to not having the slides behind me, but this is nice. Uh, this is our campus uh, right on Roosevelt Island. Uh, you can see Manhattan in the background because we're just one subway stop away from Manhattan. Uh, this is the long thing, Roosevelt Island, so really cool. Stop by and see the campus if you're in New York. All right, this was uh, also mentioned, so it's not a surprise to you anymore. It would not have been a surprise if you just look at me, but when I was younger, I played professional basketball. Uh, this is a while ago. Uh, and uh, this is in the 90s, so just before the web was picking up uh, uh, and uh, the Israeli league, we had many players come from uh, the United States to, to play, uh, former uh, well, pre-NBA players. And we used to joke that on the, fl the flight to Israel was so difficult that uh, they, uh, their, the height of the players coming from the US uh, they'd lost two inches just flying over <laughs> the ocean. And what, what was really happening is that their, their agent knew that height matters, right? Height in basketball matters. Uh, so they just added 2%, uh, two, sorry, two inches to their uh, uh, listed height uh, because, you know, a six foot 10 center suddenly becomes a legitimate seven footer. It's a big deal. You can get a, a nice bump in, in, in salary. So, some ideas I'll return to today. Uh, this relates to signaling. Uh, uh, height is an assessment signal it shows, uh, honestly, uh, reflects on your ability to play basketball. It doesn't explain all your ability to play basketball, uh, but it reflects on it uh, pretty honestly. Uh, and it's hard to fake, other than when you're on the other side of the ocean and this is pre web and there's no way for the team to actually check that the player is a seven uh, footer, so that's uh, easy to fake there. But, but still, they, didn't, uh, they couldn't fake too much because there was trust involved as well, right? The agent, they wanted to keep working with the same team 
or even in the same country, we could not just uh, add four or 10 inches uh, to a listed height. So two was kind of what they allowed themselves. <laughs> so in this talk, uh, I will connect some of the work, as I, uh, uh, as I mentioned, that we've done in the context of the sharing economy. Uh, I'll talk about uh, uh, trust. Uh, I'll talk about location logs for mobile devices. Uh, I will, and then I will connect everything in the context of signaling theory to some of the issues around uh, fake news. So I will spend a, a mode of my time talking about this second uh, study that we did on Airbnb. So uh, what is trust? As you can imagine, as probably some of you know, trust is a very well-studied concept in social science and uh, many, many books and dissertations and, and uh, uh, different uh, uh, research uh, was done on it. So just uh, for the purpose of this talk, we'll talk about trust is uh, kind of a three-part relation. So it's a level, we have uh, two people, a truster and trustee, and there is a probability for uh, somebody who's trusting someone else uh, for the trustee to perform a particular action, right? So if I, I trust someone to do uh, something in particular, right? So uh, when I, uh, I may trust a, a store with my laundry, uh, but not with fixing my coat, right? Or, Definitely not with uh, uh, lending them a million dollars. Um, so we're going to consider that uh, as trust. Or even uh, another thing you can think about when you talk about trust is uh, the level in which you do the investigation. So a lot of the work on trust has been, uh, been in the micro level. So looking at individual uh, dyadic interactions, so a lot of game theory stuff has been done, uh, the trust games, the prisoner's dilemma, all that stuff is in, in that realm. On the other hand, there are macro questions you can ask about trust, like trust in institutions and general trust attitudes and all the information that is uh, a little uh, uh, less, a little more abstract. And what we're doing here, perhaps, is something that uh, people have called embedded trust, uh, which we look at dyadic trust, but how it's mitigated by the context of the network and uh, the website and, and the other things that are afforded around that service. So we're going to talk about embedded trust, and especially uh, embedded trust on Airbnb, which uh, was interesting to us uh, because it, Airbnb really requires a lot of trust. As the founder <laughs> said, over the internet, we're going to invite strangers to sleep in our homes. It's going to be huge. <laughs> so how uh, is it going to be huge? There are a lot of things that can, be, uh, that can go wrong that anyone can uh, imagine and think about, right? So the host, uh, you know, place can just not be clean, uh, the host will not help me get what I need, uh, it won't just, just show up, uh, maybe they're charging me more than uh, the property is worth, maybe it's just going to kill me, <laughs> everything uh, is possible here. So Airbnb created a lot of different mechanisms to help uh, create trust, so allow people to trust uh, uh, one another and make, uh, make a booking and stay with them. So for example, and I'm not going to talk about all of them, there are reputation systems, uh, there are different assurance policies. Uh, there are uh, a bunch of uh, computer media communications that are allowed. There are other things as well. In this talk today and in our work, we looked at the profile information and trying to understand how uh, it creates trust. And in particular, we looked at the text uh, that the host uh, posts and how it signals trust to the potential uh, guests. So. Here you go, you can choose the host. Uh, the first host, you read the profile, and it says, you know, blah, 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 and also it says, life is beautiful, so let's enjoy it. Uh, kind of a life motto. Uh, <coughs> the other host uh, may say, you know, blah, 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 uh, we look forward to uh, hosting you, right? That's the kind of language, real language, that people use in their profile. In fact, uh, here's a real host that uh, uh, Xiao stayed with, actually, for a month, my student. Uh, and they wrote a little bit past the, uh, themselves. We'll go back to the details of exactly what they wrote uh, later. So we were wondering how uh, these profiles contribute to uh, the trust. So the guests looked at how do they evaluate them, how will they uh, perceive uh, the text. So kind of questions that we ask is, uh, first of all, what kind of information, what are the strat strategies, right? What do people post? Uh, 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 on the profiles to signal the trustworthiness. Uh, the other is what are the effects of the different uh, 
think that they post on perceived trust coordinates and I'll define it a little bit more carefully. Um, the third is whether uh, um, that trust coordinates have any effect on choice. Like, if, if, will you prefer someone who is more trustworthy over another? And finally, uh, we looked at whether we, we can uh, predict that computationally, right? So whether we can feed it to an algorithm that will say, yes, this uh, host will be more trustworthy than another host. So here are the same questions in outline form for the study. So I'm going to talk about uh, each of them, some more briefly than others. So first, let's, uh, let's see, what does Airbnb even ask people to say? Uh, if you look at the uh, interface, uh, that's what it used to be when we did the study. Um, they ask you to describe yourself, and then they give you a few. Oh, <coughs> oh that was because of you. You just lost some brightness on that screen. Mm -hmm. It came back. Uh, what do they do? Uh, uh, so they ask them about their interests. They ask them about their travel. They ask them about their hosting or, or uh, style, and they ask them about they ask them about their life motto. That's the prompt, right? They really, as you can see, this is an empty text box, so people can enter whatever uh, they want. So what do they want, and uh, uh, what do they want to post? Process, coding, uh, we did this thing, and mechanical turk. I'm going to skip all those details, uh, just to say that we, uh, uh, we had some way to develop the categories, to find, discover, and develop the categories from the data. And then we uh, uh, collected the notations from Amazon Mechanical Turk to get four, uh, 5,000, sorry, 1,000 profiles and 5,000 sentences in those profiles, uh, the eight topics uh, or tag or labeling for eight topics that appeared or did not appear in any one of those sentences. And this data set, I'll give the link again, but the data set is available for download. Um, so now we have uh, the code, the data. So what do hosts disclose in their profiles? So one thing they uh, say very naturally uh, is where they live or where they come from. I'm from Ireland, but I live in uh, Manhattan. The other thing, uh, and about 70%, I think, yeah, almost 70% of the hosts mention that in their profile. The other thing they might mention is work or education. Uh, I'm an architect. Um, they also talk about their interest and uh, tastes. Uh, so the interest probably some, uh, somewhat uh, uh, prompted by the Airbnb interface. Uh, uh, as well as relationship and personality, right? These are more of a, a personal things that are related more closely to their life. So they talk about uh, they're married or girlfriend or boyfriend. They talk about personality uh, and trying to describe themselves a little bit more. And finally, they also do the, the uh, Airbnb specific when they, they ask them to talk about their hosting style of travel and people actually do that, right? They talk about hospitality, I'll be a great host, I'm looking forward to your stay, I'll take care of your needs and all that stuff. And, and they talk about how they travel on Airbnb and off Airbnb as well. Um, and 8% of them find it in their hearts to actually uh, report on the life model like Airbnb asked them to. And I'll show you that this is a really bad idea. <laughs> um, so our host, as you can see, so same categories. Uh, uh, this is uh, Lindsay, right? She talks about work and education. She talks about uh, relationships. She talks about uh, the hospitality uh, in her profile as well. Okay. So one thing we wanted to see is whether, whether these even are meaningful, like whether they'll, they'll, uh, uh, those patterns will follow some kind of uh, uh, trend that we may expect. So to do that, we looked at uh, remote versus, versus on-site uh, hosts. So on-site hosts are hosts that uh, uh, lend a room in an apartment, so yeah, you end up being with them, so you share a space with them. And uh, remote are uh, ones that give you the key or you pick up the key from some box and you never see them. So you'd expect that if this uh, self-descriptions are strategic, you will see differences between on-site and remote uh, hosts. And indeed you do. So one thing uh, that you see very, clear, very clearly is that the uh, on-site hosts will post more. Right? They'll, they'll, they'll send more signal. Right? They'll be, uh, uh, be more consequential for them to find a good match, uh, uh, to provide uh, more trustworthy information because you're actually going to share the space with them, so they, they share more. In particular, they don't just share uh, more information, 
they also share more information that will be relevant about their personality and about the things that you may interact with them about. So they talk more about interesting states, and they talk more about personality than the remote host that you're never going to see. Okay, so there is evidence that people are using this dialogue strategically. Okay, so now we have a general idea of what uh, host might disclose in their profile. We uh, proceed to see if there are consequences, right? If those are contributing in any way to trustworthiness. So let's go back to uh, thinking about trust to be able to measure this question. So trust, measuring trust uh, is, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, it's been a topic of research in social science for many uh, years, but we're actually talking about uh, uh, trust, which is the, the particular level of probability, as we said, in which an agent, uh, trust <coughs> the other agent, will do a particular action. Um, hard to do in a real system, right? We can't ask people to choose and go stay in an Airbnb. Uh, we can observe the Airbnb data directly as well. And even if we could, it would still be hard to tweak the trust away from all the other uh, factors. So we can directly measure uh, what we would call trust. There's also trustworthiness, right? The trustworthiness is attributed, uh, attribute of the trustee, uh, in our case, uh, the host. So we, we don't actually know how trustworthy the hosts are uh, on Airbnb. The assumption is Airbnb works because most of them are trustworthy, right? But the thing is not all of them look trustworthy. So, which is what we measure in, in this work, right? So we're gonna have, we're gonna assume that uh, somebody is a potential guest and is gonna tell us uh, how uh, they perceive the trustworthiness of the host that they're looking at. So this may or may not, uh, I had a discussion with uh, 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 Nick Christakis about this, and he's like, oh, you, you want to, sh you know, we should show that the perceived trustworthiness relates to real trustworthiness. And, and I said, I have no expectation that it actually relates to real trustworthiness. Uh, but, uh, but this is related to signals online, and we'll talk about that as well. So how do we get perceived trustworthiness? We had the guest uh, uh, trustworthiness scale that was uh, adapted from a scale that was used in other uh, setting, uh, in organizational in, in trust in organizations. Uh, so. Uh, we modified it to a six item scale that asked about ability. Uh, so we, we basically so we showed now the, the Raiders mechanical torturers uh, a profile, the text of the profile, and they had to annotate these uh, uh, items. So does this person look like they're capable of paying their own rent? Uh, do they look like they maintain a clean, safe, and comfortable household? Uh, we also asked about benevolence. Will they satisfy, will they satisfy my need? Uh, and integrity, will they not? Pick me up. So, again, mechanical third process here. We took our profiles uh, that we had. Uh, we had five judge judges uh, uh, rate the trustworthiness of uh, every uh, every profile uh, according to a scale, and then we got received trustworthiness uh, ratings for every profile. Does that make sense so far? Great. So. What does determine a perceived trustworthiness? Uh, so here is one thing that turned out contributes to uh, uh, more trustworthiness, uh, writing longer self-descriptions. So the more you wrote, and this is again consistent with uh, 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 the theory that says, okay, that there's less uncertainty, right? So the more I know about you, the more I will trust you. And it's true, the more you write, the more uh, uh, trustworthy rating, the higher trustworthy rating that you'll get. Although you'll notice that this is on a log scale, the x-axis, so that means it's actually flattens out. So after you write about, I think it's about uh, 50 words, the benefits of writing more are kind of uh, uh, not that good, so you can stop at 60. Okay. Don't need to edit it down, but you can stop. <coughs> uh, and this is, by the way, this is just for the ability, and I'm, well, since every, all the, uh, uh, trustworthiness uh, dimensions that we collected were very highly correlated. I'm just gonna collapse them all together for the rest of the discussion. So you may think uh, that writing more is the only thing that you need to do, but there's also uh, the matter of how many uh, topics you use. So I'm not gonna show you the interaction between the length and the number of topics, like the different, remember the eight topics that we had, the different uh, topics that you use in your uh, text. Uh, but it turns out, this is just one, uh, way to show 
that uh, more, the more topics that you mention, uh, the better your, this is the, uh, um, I think this is the frequency distribution of trustworthiness scores. Yes, so this, now we have the perceived trustworthiness on the x-axis, so you can see that you mentioned more topics, this is the, the lighter uh, curves, uh, you get higher scores uh, on average. Right? This is even after controlling for length, so you can write 60 words on how hospitable you are, you'll get probably a lower trustworthiness score if you write uh, the same amount of words on uh, four or five different uh, of these topics. Okay, then the question, of course, uh, which I already alluded to, is which uh, topics uh, perform better? Are there any topics that uh, you should choose over the others? And in particular, this becomes uh, uh, more complicated to do because there are different combinations that are hard to tweak uh, apart. And what we did uh, here in the paper, we elaborate a little bit more, is just look at uh, what happens if you mention one single topic. Uh, what happens to your trustworthiness uh, score? And uh, the number of uh, profiles that we had here is 117. This was uh, uh, validated when we had uh, a larger data set that I will not talk about uh, um, in this talk, but, uh, but the trends were, were similar. And the question here, what I show in this uh, figure, is that for, uh, I'll walk over here, so it's a little more complicated. So here we see the, uh, uh, the topic, so each of these uh, uh, single topic profiles, what topics, so, so these are uh, the, the profiles I mentioned, only the work of education. Uh, this is the perceived trustworthiness score that they got, and these are the, uh, the bottom and the top uh, quartiles. Uh, so you can see, for example, that work in education, uh, it was unclear uh, how it contributed to your perceived trustworthiness, so but uh, you're kind of in the middle. But uh, if you wrote about uh, life model and values, uh, life is beautiful, let's enjoy it, your trustworthiness uh, sucked. <laughs> On the other hand, if you were writing, hey, I'm going to be uh, a great host, we look forward to hosting you, uh, you got very uh, high, uh, a, a top quartile trustworthiness scores. Right. So this is for, for single topics, so the interactions become uh, more difficult, but again validated when we had a larger uh, such data set. Okay, so if you just, if you don't want to write long, if you just want to write one sentence, just say that you'll take care of all their needs and you'll be <laughs> better off. This might remind you of someone, you are not alone. If you <laughs> um, All right, so we know what they post. Uh, we know how that contributes to perceived trustworthiness. Uh, and we had uh, a couple of other questions. One, if uh, the trustworthiness score predicts the uh, choice. So if we, uh, if we show you two profiles, for example, which is what we actually did in the paper, I'm not going to show it here. Uh, if we show it to different profiles, they're going to prefer the one that had a higher uh, perceived trustworthiness score. And the answer is yes. Read the paper. Uh, the other question that we had that I'm uh, going to skip is whether we can computationally predict uh, the trustworthiness score, right? So we can have, uh, uh, in this case, we have an algorithm that first uh, classifies each sentence into, into the category, and then creates a model that tries to uh, predict the trustworthiness score that will be assigned by humans based on those uh, categories. Uh, the answer is, okay, it's not really yes, somewhat. I would call uh, machine learning. You can somewhat, uh, to some degree, you can do this, uh, and that's uh, that. The details uh, about uh, that are in the uh, other paper. So these are the two papers. You can find it on the lab's uh, website, stec.nyc. Uh, you should also go there if you want to see a nice little uh, hyperlapse of uh, view from Cornell Tech. <laughs> is, uh, uh, all right, and other than the, uh, the two uh, uh, papers, we also have the data sets and even the little uh, library that we created to classify those uh, the profiles. So these are all available uh, from, the, uh, from the same website as well. 
Okay, quick uh, summary so far. Uh, as I mentioned, this was the mode of the talk, so the next part, so I'll go over more quickly. How much time do I still do I have? Uh, Nobody's counting. Great. Uh, <laughs> so we created an annotated data set of uh, 1,200 Airbnb host profiles. Uh, we showed that some features uh, are, uh, will impact the perceived trustworthiness uh, of the profile. And we showed that that predicts choice and that we can also predict that automatically. So I'm almost done with that part. Uh, let me connect that to signaling theory and, and start uh, uh, kind of thinking through uh, that. And then I'm going to talk about uh, another work where we look at maybe generating other reliable signals of trust and then uh, hypothesize how this relates to truth and fake news. Um, so signaling theory, as uh, I mentioned, uh, has been at work for billions of years uh, already. Uh, but we discovered it in the context of uh, economy in, in 1973 and, and biology in 1975, although it wasn't widely accepted in biology until the 90s. Uh, Donath, uh, Judy Donath, uh, wrote uh, very nicely about how uh, it worked in social systems. I'm going to borrow a lot of ideas from her uh, in her 2007 paper. So signaling theory really is obsessed with uh, what keeps communications honest. And why are certain uh, signals, and when uh, are certain single sig signals reliable and honest, and, and when they're not? And essentially, one of the core concepts we'll come, keep coming back to you uh, to is uh, that the cost of deception has to be uh, uh, greater than the benefits, right? So in this case, we're looking at the flamboyant cuttlefish, and the colors say that they're toxic. And why is, uh, why is that an honest signal? Because anyone can develop those colors, but there is a cost for developing those colors. The sharks could see you. So if you develop these colors and you're not poisonous, you're gonna pay a price. Uh, if uh, uh, you develop those colors, and uh, uh, that's a, a signal that I'm poisonous, don't touch me. Right? So, um, the cost of deception has to be uh, greater than the benefits. Then we have a couple of uh, signal classes. Uh, one of them uh, is assessment signals. So the idea of assessment signals, they're reliable because to produce those signals, you have to have that quality. Right? So they're directly related to the quality. Uh, and that must be easy to evaluate. So if we see someone uh, lifting a 500 pound uh, weight over their heads, you know that they're strong. Right? There's no way to uh, uh, mistake that. Um, conventional signals, on the other hand, are not inherently reliable. And this is the self-description in online communication, right? The, the Airbnb uh, profile, right? I'm just going to write uh, whatever I want. Uh, there's no way to directly assess them. Uh, so they must be kept honest by in other uh, ways. So if you remember this guy, uh, we talked about the height uh, is an assessment signal, so they directly uh, this reflects on your ability to play basketball, and it is hard uh, to fake, at least when you're not across the ocean. Uh, why not fake, uh, fake completely? We also talked about that and, and the trust that is uh, required. Uh, here we have uh, Lindsay. Why not just fake uh, whatever she has uh, in her profile? Why don't you write? She can write whatever she wants. Uh, um, and. Uh, so the question is, you know, how, what keeps those, what keeps these signals that Lindsay is uh, sending, what keeps them uh, uh, honest? So the answer is uh, uh, trust, right? So for the basketball agent, the ability of, or, or the, the cost will be not being able to work with a team or not being able to work with a country or getting a bad name, not being able to do any more uh, transactions because uh, the team will not trust him any uh, anymore. Future interactions is what keeps them uh, honest in this case. And the host, what we have here, remember we talked about embedded trust and trust in context, uh, the hospitality promises are kept honest by the outside intervention of Airbnb reviews. Right? So the cost of deception will be getting uh, bad reviews. They can't be a great host. Well, they promise to be a great host. Uh, they get bad reviews. They're not uh, a great host. And the benefit might be, uh, right, so uh, might not be worth uh, 
Or let me, let me, let me try to uh, say it another way. Uh, a lot of thought uh, uh, from the game theory economists and, and others on uh, how to connect uh, signaling and trust. Uh, but the idea that the trust probability that we assign as a truster is based on kind of evaluating both the benefit of the cost of a signal uh, for both people who actually hold the quality, without great host, and the people who do not hold the quality, they're not uh, great host. And the idea here that if we assume that the receiver, like someone who is evaluating uh, um, a profile, knows more or less what the base rate is in, in, uh, in the system, then they will, uh, they will base their probability uh, on that. So with that in mind, let me just uh, very quickly show you uh, another project where we were searching for more uh, different uh, potentially reliable signals of uh, trust, although we didn't uh, directly ask about trust in this study, uh, and then briefly connect to uh, where we are today. So in this study, we looked at uh, uh, whether we can create a new signal for trust that doesn't require outside intervention in terms of, in terms of reviews, uh, but does reflect some uh, property of trustworthiness and reliability, uh, and will be difficult or costly to uh, fake. And one thing that we wanted to look at is uh, location history. Right? Location is known to be a meaningful social representation of uh, self. Uh, it's automatically collected by the mobile devices, but it's then hard to fake. Right? We can we can get a pretty reliable hard to fake log of at least where your mobile device went. And our question was whether it's enough to generate a trust signal. So we never actually got to ask that question. Because we started down this road, and we saw that this is actually uh, happening, uh, excuse the pun, in a dating app called Happen. Uh, so they use similar information. We just uh, dove into what happens and what are the dynamics there. Uh, so Happen, what they do, the, it's kind of like the Tinder or whatever other dating app uh, you may or may not use. Uh, you can swipe, you can see profiles. But they also collect your location information. And based on that, they show you a, a signal of overlap, right? how many times you overlap with uh, somebody else. So in this case, you can see this is Sophie, uh, and it tells me that I, we crossed two paths. Uh, we crossed paths two times, uh, and the last one was in, uh, what was that, uh, in, in a subway station, uh, underground station in London. And so we, we actually did, we did an interview, that was an interview study, we talked to a lot of these uh, people, and we uh, tried to understand how they made sense of that data. Uh, it turns out that they, they had, they hugely overinterpreted the data, but they, they took it as a very strong signal. Uh, uh, partly of similarity, uh, which is perhaps not great, uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but also they had some heuristics about what it means with, with other people overlap. If you overlap too much, it was not a good signal, but if they overlap just enough, it was an interesting signal for them as well. Uh, and maybe one uh, more note that they, they didn't, they actually believed and accepted the location signal as a truthful signal, right? So what's written on top, she may or may not be an interior architect, uh, but they felt that there was very strong warranting in where she actually uh, hangs out. So there was uh, there is some evidence uh, that it may reflect some uh, trustworthiness. I'm, I'm hesitant to say that word because we haven't actually studied it. Uh, uh, perhaps in not an ideal way, but it is hard to uh, fake. By the way, this can be done not for just for location. One can imagine finding similarities that way based on uh, you know the places you visit on the web. Uh, videos you watch, real life behavior, and it doesn't even just have to be similarity, right? So happen, compute similarity between me and, not, and another, but you can also just warrant their activity and show, display that to me in some way. In fact, based on similar overlap, uh, this is, Andrea, I think your work relates to, to, to this as well. Uh, this is very much Butler-mesque. Uh, we uh, created a community app uh, that uses location overlaps to try to understand how we can uh, increase awareness, uh, connections, and trust uh, in a community. Uh, I'm going to skip this process, uh, uh, but the, uh, uh, we have a couple of papers that show that uh, uh, a system like that that shares, allows people to share their, uh, privately share the location log uh, can help increase awareness in the community, but also uh, 
uh, brings out uh, some of the issues that the community might have as well. Okay. So what uh, what does it have to do with uh, with fake news? Well, one of the uh, issues is that we don't have right now uh, an honest reliability and credibility signal on the web. Uh, we don't have a situation where the uh, cost of uh, deception is much greater than uh, the benefit. And the funny thing, it actually used to be the case online. The young people here might not remember, but the uh, uh, but us older people who looked at the early web know that even uh, the fact that you had online presence and how your online presence was presented, who showed us their original on this slide? <laughs> uh, um, was uh, very much uh, a signal of quality, right? So to have a website and to have the means to, uh, for that website to look good was a, a, a strong signal. It was hard to fake. Uh, it was uh, only available to uh, organizations of high uh, quality, right? They could pay that cost of signaling. Right? It was hard to fake and therefore uh, uh, assumed as an honest signal. Then uh, that obviously failed. <laughs> uh, now anyone can put anything on the web that makes it look, uh, really good. Um, and then we had social signals, and then uh, they fell, uh, they are failing us as well. So the social signal, the likes, the views, the friends, the followers, uh, those are has, uh, the follower factory. If you haven't read the New York Times story about the follower factory, obviously should. Uh, um, have shown that there's, these are easy to fake with little cost and penalty. Uh, this is another quote from Donna that back in 2007 said, uh, she actually was quoting Dana Boyd, uh, that uh, once having many friends in on social network it becomes a signal of status or a signal of uh, trust, uh, you just invent uh, uh, the ability to do uh, more. So these things are, have been used but are now failing as signals. Uh, so what do we really want to signal? If we want a signal of truth on the web, we want a signal perhaps to the quality of work that's been done, we want a signal of objective processes, uh, maybe the history of accurate reports, and my time is almost up, but you, you wanted me to talk about the solutions, right? So I'm going to take a couple of more minutes. Uh, so, uh, so how could these things uh, uh, possibly be uh, communicated, right? So you should, be, uh, you should have signals we already established that are hard to produce if you don't actually possess that uh, quality. And you have to have the cost of deception or be more than the benefit, which is actually not the case today. So what are the solutions? Right, we're looking for social technologies that support the pursuit of facts and encourage trustworthy institutions. Well, I don't know what the solutions <laughs> are. Uh, there are some directions. Here are some uh, ideas. One, uh, uh, local, uh, local community. Much like Andrea here, I think the, the solutions will have to come from the local community. There's something about local journalism uh, that, that seems to me too like uh, a good source of uh, uh, a good way, a good place to start. Maybe it's the familiarity or the relevance uh, or the fact that you can actually use this more approachable uh, and therefore creates more trust. Uh, you can maybe see that building where news is getting generated. I'm not sure what it is, uh, but that could be one uh, potential direction, uh, not, not unrelated I think, to the movement uh, and location log work. Uh, another direction is, I don't know how it's done again, but uh, Maybe some warranted evidence that work has a really strong signal that's hard to fake, that work has been done, uh, uh, whether it's fact checking or whatever other kind of work that we've done into uh, a news report or something, information online. Uh, uh, something about the background, uh, some proof that cannot be faked about the background of the person that's, reading, that's writing or sharing information online. Finally, another uh, direction can uh, perhaps be uh, risk, right? Right now we have no uh, risk in the online signals, no risk from the people who are uh, uh, verifying those signals. So that, as I mentioned, the likes and the views and the retweets, there is zero uh, risk. So we have to make the reader vulnerable or the sharer vulnerable uh, so they can produce an honest uh, signal of uh, trust in that uh, article. So. Uh, to uh, quick examples, what if you banned users that shared 
uh, false information. There are a lot of questions here, for example, who uh, validates whether information is true or not. Uh, but if there was some risk for me when I click uh, retweet or I click share on Facebook, uh, those shares will be much, uh, the, the, the signal will be much uh, stronger. It has to be real uh, risk. There's a company called uh, Civil, joincivil.com, that uh, came up or testing out, I would say, some crypto uh, blockchain solution where you can challenge uh, news articles uh, and, uh, with cryptocurrency uh, and uh, get, get money back or, or lose your money if your challenge was incorrect. So that would be very, a pretty strong signal, assuming that the fact-checking process uh, is, is somewhat uh, believable. In short, uh, we don't know. Uh, but this, uh, as I think this workshop uh, over deposits, uh, is one of the most important questions of our, our time. And let's uh, make sure to figure it out. So thank you. This is some last video. <laughs>
the types of signals, like assessment signals are really difficult to fake, but conventional signals you can very easily fake, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, for going back to your Airbnb example, like it's in the host interest, uh, or it, it doesn't really cost the host much to deceive by saying, hey, I'm the most hospitable person. Mm -hmm. But then it's actually um, problematic for the, for the guest, if, uh, or harmful for the guest, if, if the deception, active deception is going on. Um, so, so I'm just, I'm just wondering, is there, is there any like through your research, have you figured out a way to handle this tension, maybe uh, in the shared uh, Ghanaian community? Uh, no, uh, I think again in the shared economy, what we have, um, because the the reviews are tied to real transactions, so there is risk, right? Mm -hmm. For me, it's a, there, there is something that involves vulnerability, right? So I have to leave a review. I have to stay with someone, so I can fake that stay, but I still spend $20 on Airbnb's fees, even if I fake it, uh, and then I get to leave a review, and that review warrants my self-description. Uh, but that was a process in which you know, I risk something, uh, and that doesn't happen in many other places online. Uh, and I think that's partly what the, the civil is trying to do, right? So I may risk something to say, this article is wrong, and, but until I risk it, I can just discuss it forever, right? But, uh, uh, and everybody will have their view. Uh, maybe that risk is a, is a better signal of trust, if you have a way to figure out if it was uh, true or not. One other, uh, in the New York Times, there was a Facebook proposal to look at uh, uh, how many people pay for subscription <coughs> uh, for, for a news organization. And that, uh, that could be an assessment signal. So in theory, right, you say, oh, if this, pl this place is valuable, if the New York Times is valuable, a lot of people will pay for it. It turns out that the assessment signal requires that uh, the signal uh, reflects on the quality that you want to assess, right? So uh, you want that signal to reflect on reliability, but in online information, it doesn't reflect reliability. It just reflects the fact that you're entertaining, right? Or that, that mm -hmm. uh, your views align with mine. So that is not a great signal. Um, so I think Facebook would be wrong to continue to use that. Um, so, uh, but I don't know what will be a more reliable. Right. Yeah. So almost it seems like you know you mentioned that you, you through the signals it also seems like you're you're giving out this identity. Like let's say I'm a Trump supporter and if if I'm spreading fake news about Hillary and then no no matter how much uh, somebody else corrects me, I, I would still be trying to signal that okay this is my identity, this is my group identity, and I I want to portray the hatred towards the other group. So there's this that other factor going in, mm -hmm. uh, like why the use of signals in the wrong way, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, there is there is also work uh, I can point you to that ties identity to mm -hmm. in this to signaling and, and trust, uh, which I think is critical. Mm -hmm. issue. So we can go on. I have a few more, but I would like to open it up for the audience. We have like maybe less than five minutes here. Yeah, sure. Um, let's see, there's a conversation over. <laughs> <laughs> something on your bio, your trust was in it went down. And they seem, for example, your life motto, right? It seems like really innocuous. Like, why would that happen? Right. Uh, great question. In the, in the, in the um, I, I don't know the answer. I can only say that in our larger scale of education work, uh, we did some uh, uh, LDA on the topics and tried to connect uh, the, the more open-ended uh, topic classification to what people, what trustworthiness rating people got. And, and uh, I think it has to do with the, this connected, I think the life model connected to the fact, for example, that the uh, Brooklyn artist types usually mm -hmm. got low trustworthiness rating. Uh, it was something about the, 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 the signal of where, what you do and what you work that communicated to people uh, whether or not you'll be a reliable person. I think the life model kind of fell into that. So
perhaps, and that, but that, be, that becomes really tricky to, to study, uh, so I don't have that answer. Uh, it, it could be, and again, more topics, we show that more topics is better, so it could be that it's not hurting anymore. I just have a really quick question, and that's, did, did you examine the, the visual data that was present? Um, because my guess is that people are zeroing in on the image, yeah. and they're seeing someone who looks like them. So if you have all of this textual data, but you have someone who's black, yeah. or, or who looks unkempt, yeah. or is you know has some disability, yeah. d d does that change how the, the um, uh, textual data is perceived by the reviewer? Uh, we have... Perfectly, only took the locations, only took the description story. So the, the our raiders and everybody only mm -hmm. saw the textual description, and obviously everything interacts. So the, your reviews and your house and your profile photo and your text. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're working with some economists. Actually, the ones that did it was a study that was focusing only on photos. Okay. Uh, and we're working with them to, to use everything together to, mm -hmm. to see what. actually all highly correlated. I think it was at the 0.85 level. So the model of trust isn't actually differentiated at all. It's just like trust, right, oh, as you're defining it, right? But maybe it's not really trust. Maybe it's something more like it has to do with people's schemas, or it has to do with, or with uh, how they, people are inferring uh, from uh, qualities about the person, which, and those qualities have to do with, with uh, fundamental trust. And then you're tying that to signaling theory, which is fine, but signaling theory is, I'm gonna make an analogy here, it's a little bit like behaviorism. You can use it to describe human, a, a component of human interaction, right? You can say when people get rewards, they do things, right? But, and, and there's some power in that. But it's a very reduced view of the person. Um, it's a very re reduced view of the motives that they have. And if you look at uh, the reason that we came to have cognitive psychology was in part because there were challenges to the behavioristic mode of understanding. In fact, it turns out that people's behavior is much more complicated than a behavioral scheme be would account for. Yeah. And here, too, I feel like you're pulling in signaling, and it's just really the most simple view. So therefore, it's likely to fall apart when you add more complexity in to the, uh, to the equation. For example, here you're not uh, time it would be an issue that you could uh, repeated encounters <coughs> would be an issue uh, and uh, uh, we don't know Airbnb has been very popular it's very nice it offers less expensive places to stay it's lovely but in fact it may itself be a shooting star whose right. popularity is going to wane over time so there's right. So this is a great point. So one, one thing to say maybe is the, uh, in the paper, uh, so here was, uh, we're not claiming, so I don't think signaling theory has any predictive uh, uh, quality over the Airbnb study. That it, in fact, we didn't start that in that direction. And, and we didn't, uh, in the paper, actually, we used uh, exactly the expectation of future interactions, the profile as promised uh, framework as a driver for uh, the investigation and the findings. So this is from Ellison and Hancock and Toma. Uh, the idea that uh, you're, uh, uh, there is an expectation of future interaction and that's what gives you a subscription uh, 
honest. Uh, just one future in the signal interaction, right? If there's in this no case, expectation one, but repeated future interactions. But that's true for dating as well, which was their concept uh, for distant theory. Uh, one or more. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, and the signaling theory to me was just, uh, the study was uh, something that drove us to think about, think about signaling theory. And I think that, yes, it's not, I don't think we can expect people uh, to act according to it, but I think we can expect organizations to think about uh, these signals. And we've seen those signals online, as, as I mentioned, uh, uh, and we, we're thinking, we're looking at the initiatives like the, the Trust Initiative and other initiatives that are going to add like uh, banners that say, oh, this is a trusted journalist, right? And, and these, these are the signals that I think organizations send that I think need to be discussed. In that. So, so I'd love to pursue this. So I do want to make a last quick point. Like your, uh, there are actually repeated interactions which happen on Airbnb that are returned. Yes, so maybe one yeah, way to measure it. A small number of repeated interactions. Right. Yeah. Okay. Let me ask you one more question. Oh. It's not too long. Uh, um, so around the time that we read your paper in the reading group, I posted a Craigslist roommate ad, and ever since then I've been getting scams, mm -hmm. like <laughs> scam emails, and they have longer description and they cover more topics in the emails. And I kind of connected all those eight topics, and they have been mentioned in those emails. I almost get them every two, three days. Mm -hmm. I don't trust these emails, and these days, just because they conform to these eight topics, I kind of don't trust them. Mm -hmm. So what do you have to say there? Yeah, uh, so, <laughs> say, so, uh, so, so, so the signal has lost are, its meaning, right? That's right. These are in smart the uh, scammers, right? I think they, they, they because they're the cost of the They probably read your work. Yeah, yeah. 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 Game the system. I, I, I don't. I have a. Uh, there was uh, some follow-up uh, news uh, report. I don't, I don't know if I have it here. That says uh, uh, increase your stock board, uh, trustworthiness. Write about more stuff. You know. So there was <laughs> the news. They made, he made it prescriptive. So maybe the scammers did that. Uh, but I think that's exactly illustrates the point, right? That the cost uh, to them, uh, the deception is really is really easy to do, and the benefits are much higher than the cost. And, you know, uh, so you know, so back in the days, of the early days of the email, people talked about uh, spam and how to prevent spam by uh, charging uh, a small amount for sending an email. Mm -hmm. right? So then you can vast it, but that that will increase the cost. But, uh, Even uh, so, going back to the the example of the, the flamboyant uh, fish, right? So, if a, a small and again in biology they looked at it and showed that these strategies are stable, but if just a small amount of fish were actually faking it, that would be okay. But if a large amount of fish were faking it, that would fail, right? So that's but that's exactly the point, right? You, it's kind of an arms race, but 